the morning. I must admit to you that I uh, am not a morning person, okay? Uh, there's very few people I would get up at this hour to come and make a speech, except Dr. Crandall and Debbie, who are both been very supportive of leadership. So I'm pleased to be with you this morning. I got a little worried when she started uh, talking about politics, because generally that's not something you talk about until afternoon anyway. This is, this is really very, very, very controversial. You know, I used to do leadership speeches, and I was connected with, on the board of Franklin University for a number of years, and it was really, as I think Kathy did too, and I know Debbie did, admire Dr. Paul Adi. So when I was first invited to make a formal speech in leadership, I thought, I better go back and read what Dr. Adi says about leadership. And so it's fascinating, so I can, I can, I can give you a little of what I remember, which was the debate about whether uh, people are born as leaders, or whether you can make leaders, or whether you can take a manager and turn a manager into a leader. All of these sort of a theoretical, I think, kind of things. But, you know, I have to admit to myself that the only thing I could really talk about as it relates to leadership is my personal experience through, through the years and how I've kind of woven in and out of leadership positions, some by accident, uh, some by pressure to do something that I didn't really want to do, and some of you, I would say, some things that I really wanted to have an opportunity to do. I'm going to start out this morning, this morning, start out just saying that I think the one thing that you have to remember is if you want to be a leader, you want to be a leader for the right reason. You don't want to be a leader simply because you think that there's a lot of glory or power or whatever goes to it, but for the reasons that you think you have something to offer, something that you can bring to the table, something that you can hopefully help other people. So really when I, um, I started out very young, I'm not quite sure what motivated me. Uh, I was born in Indiana, raised in Atlanta, Georgia, lost my father at a young age when I was 11, came back to Ohio. Uh, obviously, I was, um, when I was in Georgia, I was a um, damn Yankee, and when I got back, I was a southerner. So it was kind of an experience for me, young and in my life, and I was in Finley, Ohio, as some of you know where Finley, Ohio is, and so I had an opportunity um, to actually I think I think maybe not an opportunity, but I needed to get a job at a fairly early age. Excuse me. So I went to uh, work for the Campfire Girls of Ohio, which is strong yet. And I had a great job that paid me. Are you ready for this? 25 cents an hour. All right. And I cut rolls of red taffeta into ties that they ran around. But that it opened a lot of other opportunities because I volunteered to be an assistant campfire leader when I was in high school and helped somebody run a group for about fifth graders. And that was probably my opening into leadership about the responsibilities of it. You know, if you're high school students, you don't particularly want to get up and walk about two miles to get to an elementary school, which you spend the rest of the afternoon with a bunch of fifth graders. So it was a great lesson for me, and I continued my involvement in Camp Fire Girls, became a leader, and actually, um, for a number of years while I was still there. At that particular time, I really needed a job after I graduated to paid more than 25 cents an hour, and it was, uh, Obviously, since they put my age in the newspaper all the time, I don't have to tell you how old I am. But anyway, it was, uh, I graduated out of high school, 1945, right at the end of the war. Very kind of tough time. But I did get a job. I got a job with an insurance agency. And I'm telling you this because there's, uh, I think, a little bit of a moral to this. I, don't, I like to be busy. I don't think, you know, if you want leadership skills, you like to be busy. So I went to work for an insurance agency. They weren't very busy, and I didn't have very much to do. And so the insurance agency was in a bank building. We needed to get a bank building to come up the elevator, and they, unfortunately they had a glass wall right there. So every time I would hear the elevator come, I would have to look like I was busy. I don't like to look like I was busy. So with no other job after 30 days, I quit. I think there is a little more of that if the flight is too short to spend it in a job with which you're not comfortable, you're not enjoying what you're doing. 
And so I was lucky enough to get a job at the Family Changing Center. And so that's really where my exposure to leadership, community leadership, made a huge difference to me. I worked for the, for the Chamber and Finley for nine years. I got exposed to all of the business leaders in the community. You know, I was there taking the notes and passing out the, the papers that were distributed, but I could also listen at the same time. And I think that's one of the things that drove me in the future to seek some leadership opportunities. And it was on the basis of um, what I learned it means, and you're so fortunate here in Westerville to have good political leadership. The strength of the community really depends upon the kind of people that are willing to seek office here and do serve for you. I'm not sure that many of you remember, but I was your state representative for 20 years. And I always felt good because as long as Westerville and Reynolds were in my district, I didn't have to worry about getting elected. So I had one of those rare seats in which you had a little bit more flexibility to, to do more things. But the chamber experience was a great experience. I would bring in national speakers. I could sit in the audience to listen to people talk about their past and, you know, how they got in leadership positions and how they viewed it. So it was, you know, very, very interesting to me. And I think really was that drive always of thinking about leadership. Now, I don't want to fool you. Sometimes the leadership positions you get are because you've been in the room at a meeting and there were a lot of things that were discussed in that meeting. A lot of things that took action. And when you turned around, you were the last person standing because nobody really wanted to take the leadership issue and, and run with it. But they had all of these great plans, walked out the door, and if you didn't do something, nothing, frankly, in many instances, ever got done. So I had very thin, with respect to my first child, and moved down to the Columbus area. Uh, lived for a while in Columbus. Then went to Reynoldsburg, which was just as, as, at that particular time, Reynoldsburg was a, um, a village and had just gotten to 5,000 population. If you look at it now, it's hard to imagine that. So it was just becoming a city. So I helped all of my neighbors, uh, who were all men, to help them to get elected to Reynoldsburg City Council. Um, because, you know, you were forming a new government unit. And I thought they did a fairly good job. Um, the longer I was there, the more I got involved in the community. And I kind of think sometimes I sound like Sarah Palin, and I don't mean to do that. But, you know, PTA president, because nobody else would do it. You know, I was leader of the Girl Scout group because nobody else wanted to do it. So many of the positions I had, it's not because people voted for me or chose me for the leader. It was just that I was the only one that was willing actually to do it. So I was doing all of the political work, too. I was, you know, doing a lot of things in the community, you know, organized the Fourth of July parade. You've all been there. I know many of you. I see some head shaking. And um, after a while, I kind of got to the position of not being real happy with some of the things that were happening with the city council. And so I decided to probably, as some of you have, look, I'm putting up all the yard signs. I'm distributing all the literature. I'm making all of the phone calls. I'm hosting all of the coffee. Why don't I try to elect myself? Now that was a new thought. This is 1965. It was a new thought because women weren't really running for office back then. And so the, the concept of a woman running for city council, clearly I didn't win, so the community was not ready for a woman city council. But what it did is it toughened me up a lot. It taught me how to handle the seat. It taught me how to handle all put downs as a woman. I think it's kind of fun now to go back and think about that and what we're going through right now. You know, basically, everybody would say, well, guys would say if she gets elected, we'll have to put a pink toilet seat in the restroom. Things like that that were just totally, in today's world, you wouldn't even think of happening. Or some of you remember the JC. Remember how active they were there? Well, there were a couple of JCs in city council. They came one night and put this major invitation out there for we want to get to know all of you. We're going to have this event. We want you to come. And afterwards, one of them came up and she said, well, you understand, this is a sad event, so you're not invited. Uh, the other best memory I have of, of City Council was um, a really good zoning attorney who now I ride in the same elevator with him in my office building downtown. 
So he came in and he had a, a very controversial Sony and I voted. And he challenged my vote because he assumed I was the secretary of the Tulis City Council, not a member uh, in that situation. So it's kind of a thing that you grow with. But the leadership opportunities I had there was another one of these things. As a member of city council, nobody wanted to be chairman of the finance committee. I was only working part time. You know, and because the men there too, they had full time jobs and stuff to do. So I volunteered to do it. So this was the case where I got a leadership position that I actually wanted because I'm a firm believer that you have to get into that kind of situation to really understand what government is all about. So I spent some um, 10 years. City Council, 10 years of chairman of the committee, great learning experience for me. And I'm a great believer in and I think that it probably understands that from her city council experience. And at some particular point, local government is politically, you either go up or you go out. I wasn't in a position to run for mayor, didn't want to be mayor, is on my way uh, actually leaving city council because I needed a full time job at that time. I, oldest daughter was headed off to college and so I went looking for a job and so it was very helpful that I had a little bit of Chamber of Commerce experience because I was able to get a job with the higher Chamber of Commerce. The State Chamber of Commerce is very similar to your local Chamber of Commerce except they take the responsibility obviously of doing the work with the legislature. So they're the ones down there that are lobbying on behalf of your local chambers for things that would be helpful to your community. So I went in as a typist. Every time I got a job, it was because I was a good typist. I never really, and this was before computers, okay? So people were thinking about being good guys. I never forget that. I thought, if I'd have known that talent, so I came out of high school, I was a very good typist, I just went and take a typing test. And, and basically they'd hire me because they needed typists. But they were pretty firm with me at the Ohio Chamber and said, um, we want you to understand that we're hiring you because we need typists. But you don't have any ability to move up the ladder here. So it was kind of a, I don't know about you, that sort of waved the red flag in front of, of me and basically said, some whole other, I'm going to try to prove that this is wrong, but it was a great experience. I worked for them for 23 years, I was exposed to all of the, you know, the state leadership, spent a lot of time over the legislature, sitting and listening to uh, people uh, on the committees or, you know, sessions, wondering why they couldn't see the answer being so quite as clear as I thought it was, and I learned later that it's not quite that clear. But I had a lot of leadership opportunities there with some national organizations. But again, it, it was the experience of working with people who were leaders in their own businesses that came forth and you could understand where they were coming from. And many of them took time, quite frankly, to, to reach out and to be helpful um, and let me ask them questions. Uh, and the reason I'm giving you this in chronological order is there's some, some comments I want to make at the end of, of this about not necessarily planning your life because of every step that you're going to take. And a lot of people do that and they'll say by 20 I want to be this and by you know 30 I want to be this race of, you know earned a million dollars and I want to do this. And I just kind of was one of these people that my circumstances bounced around. I didn't have a plan so it wasn't like I you know, had to have this great plan of what I was doing. But if I look back, everything that I've told you so far about what has been my life experience has contributed to my ability to actually then earn some leadership positions on my own. And I didn't realize this at the time. Just like right now, you may not realize something you're doing, and you may not see it as something that's going to be helpful to you. But if you look back in a couple of years, you're going to think, if I hadn't have done that, I might not have been able to do this in that situation. And you never want to, you know, my theory is you never want to pass up an opportunity, even if it's something that you don't think that you really want to do, because my experience is then you'll always learn something from it. It may not be something good you learn from it, but 
what you do want, it's what you want to do, and what you don't want to do. But it's always an experience to add something to, obviously, to your background and help you to do that. Well, I had torn off of politics when I went for the Ohio Chamber of Commerce. Uh, decided that my elected years were, were behind me. I'd had enough of them, actually, in uh, Reynoldsburg. And all of a sudden, in 1980, there was a, a opening on the ballot. And quite frankly, the opening was there because of who the state representative was in Russellville at that time. He was an attorney. His name is Alan Moore. He still lives close by in Polina. And Alan Moore had an opportunity to run for judge. And he was on the ballot as a candidate for state representative, representing Westerville all of the way around to 70 Reynoldsburg. So it was August, uh, primary was over. So he needed to drop off at the ballot because they created, legislature created the new judgeship, which, which Alan held actually for a number of years, and then he went to the federal bench. Um, and so I finally decided that short campaign, couple of months, two and a half months, I'd give it a try. So I got named to the ballot, got elected to the legislature, and I never will forget the comment that Alan Norris made to me when I was elected, and I think that's very true, and I thank you for that. He said some people get elected in districts that are very controlling. Other people, like me and you, get elected in districts that give you the flexibility to do the job that you see needs to be done on the basis of the information that you're receiving as a member of the legislature. So I um, went into the legislature in six months, I wanted to quit. It was, and Debbie mentioned this in her comment, the speaker was a, um, trying to figure out how to, how to describe the speaker. The speaker was a very strong, uh, man, he had been speaker by the time I got there for 59, 20 years, and he was intimidating. I don't get intimidated very easily, but he was intimidating. He would stand up at the rostrum with this big gavel, you know, that he would hold his arm. We later became good friends, but I was going to quit at six months. Somebody told me to stick around, it would get better. Uh, so I stuck around uh, and had an opportunity then to um, be in the majority. I um, I think it's as I see it for three of you up here. I have three, had three older brothers. And some, they made me very competitive. Because I just always had to fight for, you know. I had a great trick at the dining room table. They would get me upset about something when dessert was served. I'd leave the table, they'd eat my dessert. I decided after a while that wasn't a very smart thing to do. But they did make me very competitive. And that was good as far as leadership skills were concerned to be competitive. And so I didn't like being in the, in the minority in the Ohio House of Representatives. Uh, and my party had been out of the majority for gosh, 20 some years. So I started working, recruiting actually candidates. Okay, so I recruited candidates and slowly by slowly by slowly we were able to come in into the majority in the, in the 1994 election. And so, I had had to make a choice two years earlier than that because the minority leader of the House was leaving. And the choice was that if I didn't move into that position and we happened to get lucky, I might, you know, I might have a chance to be speaker, but I had to make the move. And it was something that violated generally what I did. I was always the person that believed in waiting your turn. And it's waiting your turn if you're, if you're in this line for promotion or something, you, you wait your turn, you start at the back of the line. This was one time that I didn't do that. And I was very uncomfortable with it. It worked out okay, but it's not something that I would want to have to face that decision again. But I did, so I was minority leader a couple of years, we won the majority. And by that time, I had built relationships. And I say that because relationships are extremely important if you're seeking leadership positions and which you have to be elected, and not just something that you've taken on yourself because nobody else wanted to do it. So it was a different approach to such a resume. But I spent years recruiting candidates, working on their campaigns, you know, going to their weddings, um, just getting to know them. 
And that was when people asked me today, how did you become speaker as a woman? Because there was still, even at that time, still a lot of jokes about women and their leadership. Um, and I think if I kept the clipping from the Columbus's back, that basically said, she is a soft spoken, grandmotherly looking, can she read? So that's the kind of thing that back then that she dealt with. So obviously, my intent was to try to show whether or not I could believe. And so it was a fun experience for me. And that really what gets me to maybe wind up a little bit talking about the Leadership Institute. We have one of this year's class leadership here, Judith Nebuchadnezzar, here, here and Debbie is the graduated leadership class. And the leadership class is for women. And the reason it's for women is because women are hard to get to recruit actually to run for anything. And I had that problem when I thought if there's a contribution I can make, maybe trying to help them to realize what things that they need, and I hope these are, are kind of things that, that you would appreciate. They're a little bit peculiar in many instances for women because if you sit in the room for women, most of them will say if you ask them, I'm interested in you, why won't you run why don't you run for state representative? So the first thing that they're going to say is, oh, I'm not qualified. I couldn't do that. I don't have these experience. So part of it is to, you're the expert here, Kathy, part of it is to convince them and convince you, every one of you, to never say that about the fact that I couldn't do that job. I don't have the experience. All of us have experiences. Some different than others, but experiences of just being in college, the experiences of being in a community that welcomes your input and maybe serving on the pre commission or whatever they have out here. That is, you know, that's something that you can do. And so I've had the leadership institute now. I'm pleased to uh, say that we've got about 350 women who've completed it, and it's all in trying to build their confidence. But it's not the fact, and I've had many men come to me and say, can't we be a part of this? And, I kid even said when we get all the women trained we uh, we'll consider doing it. But seriously, it is having confidence in yourself. A confidence that you've got the ability to do it knowing that there may be some things that you don't quite understand but you can learn. The other thing I find which is much more so with women but is with men leaders is women are reluctant to take a risk. Not very good risk takers. I spent a whole lot of time recruiting a, a great woman who would have been made a wonderful state of representation. Quite sure everything, you know, I'll, I'll give you an assistant to help you do this, I'll do this, 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 and the final question to me is can you guarantee that I will get elected? Well, there's no guarantee, okay? So obviously she didn't run. But it certainly, when you're looking at leadership opportunities, whether you are in a situation where it's in a corporate setting, or whether it's in a political setting, or whether it's in a community setting, or whether it's in a, you know, with your church, where there are a lot of opportunities that exist, it doesn't make any difference. Every time you take on one of those opportunities, it builds your skills, it increases your self-confidence, you're making a contribution to your community, and actually you're making a contribution to yourself. Every place that you go now, there's a lot of talk about leadership. There's a lot of talk about the fact that, you know, we, we really do need strong leaders. So it's one thing to be a leader and kind of coach through it. It's another one to make the tough decisions and step up and you need to step up and take the actions that you need to take. And that's very, very difficult to do. I spent many sleepless nights trying to figure out on the legislation that was pending, whether or not it was right to bring it to the floor, to bring it to a vote, because you know, as speaker, I got to decide which bills were going to come to the floor and be considered, and which were going to kind of sit in the rules committee and not come out. It's a terrible responsibility to do that. Let's be a diverse state like Ohio, because we are a, a city state. You know, we've got these large cities that make up, you look at Indiana, they maybe have two cities, we've got all of these cities out there, starting with the big use of the three cities, and then you know, obviously going to, to Dayton and Akron and Canton uh, and other communities. So it's a difficult state, 
actually because of the diversity of the out there to do that. It was uh, challenging. Uh, we still, you know, still people still talk about school funding. It was challenging in Westerville because that's the time the schools were going through a really difficult time out in Westerville, and they hadn't been able to get a lovely cat. I remember being out here one afternoon, Sunday afternoon, standing up in a wagon, you know, in support of the school of it. That doesn't make you very popular out there, but the important thing was the kids at Westerville were not getting the kind of education that they needed, and so it obviously uh, was something that needed to be done. But uh, again, I want to compliment you on actually your, your city, and the city is, that has provided so much opportunity, and I, I think I'm sure that many of you got concerns about things that are happening, but I think it's very well run. And to compliment Dr. Kendall on thinking that leadership is an important issue, and it's not an easy issue to actually to define. You know, if you go into a dictionary and look at leadership, the definition, the broad definition is, it's a position in which you try to get people to follow you. And that was another thing that was difficult, obviously, for me, because all of my leadership positions, until I got on running for city council, were leadership positions when I was working with volunteers. It wasn't like you could say, all of you go out and do this. You couldn't do that. They didn't have that responsibility. You had to say, if we can do this and this and this and get it done, hopefully we can have this result. But it's sort of like, you know, I type it a little bit. You, it, you can't be a leader until somebody is following you. And that's where I think probably for me, the strongest thing for me was the personal relationships that you build. And you can't be dogmatic and stand in front of the room and basically say, now this is what we're going to do today. I've been in there some people who have done that. You can't do that. Debbie, you know that. Jill, you know that. Jill is a real estate agent and so she's obviously dealing with people uh, all of the time. So that's kind of my experiences. I don't know how we're doing time-wise. Pardon? Whatever you say. <laughs> uh, it is, I know that you're going to get out of here at 8.30. I know that I've said it in many presentations and wondered why something wasn't discussed. And I am uh, willing to do a little longer Q&A, if that's all right, with you and try to answer your questions. And nothing is off the table as far as questions are concerned, even politics. So, got any questions out there? Yes. Absolutely. Maybe junior high schoolers. I mean, in some schools right now, it requires some kind of civic service you know, something in, in the community and which they have to sign up and do as part of their regular, obviously, uh, educational experience. And I think that's a great thing to do because we don't realize out there typically how much difference you can make. And that's, quite frankly, what leadership is all about. If you're doing it for the right reason, it's not about the fact that you think you have power and probably in most instances you don't have the power that everybody thinks that you have. But it's just the fact that you can do something that can make a difference in your community or in your children's lives or your life situation. Thank you for mentioning the theater. It was, uh, if, if you were going to, up to the theater, you, you saw the former speaker's bus. Yes, I always greet him when I go in the building. It's, good morning, Mr. Speaker. His name was Vern Rice. He was from actually down at Portsmouth, Ohio, which is a tough area of the state to be with. And he was, woo, okay. 
but, but he was somebody who was um, a very good politician. And so after I left the speakership, we used to get together for lunch and talk about how to manage our caucus. And that clearly, if you see the struggles in Washington, D.C. right now, that's really a challenge because you've got, at that particular point in time, you're in a room that everybody who is of your political party is in there with you, but they were all elected on their own right. So they don't have any responsibility to follow your lead if they don't want to do that. They were elected by the people of their district. And while I thought standing up at the podium conducting the meetings was going to be the most difficult challenge I had, that ended up being a piece of cake. I mean, you know, there's just so much, you got everybody up there telling you what to do, first of all. And after you do it two or three times, it just comes sort of as natural. But the issue of managing a group of people who are elected in their own right to try to address very difficult issues that were for the state of Ohio was the real challenge. And that was a people challenge. That was trying to recognize that if I'm from southeastern Ohio and you're asking me to vote for something that benefits Cleveland, Ohio, I have a problem with it. Part of the problem with something like that, frankly, is that I would suspect that uh, in the 99 members of the legislature right now, many of them have never been down to southeastern Ohio, which has its own problems in Appalachia. Many of them have not been in Cleveland, Ohio, which is a major urban city. You know, obviously don't recognize that. So I used to do trade-offs. I'd say, look, if you want a bigger caucus, you want to stay in the majority, then we've got to help our members who are from southeastern Ohio, and you have to help the ones that are from Cleveland. And when, when we get finished with it, actually everybody is doing better. But, but it is managing individuals with the tough of fertile leadership. The other kind of work, that type of thing comes pretty naturally. But individuals don't have their own thoughts. Some can be more difficult than others, as you know. Uh, and, some, and so it's, a, it's almost like being, you have to sort of diagnose in your own mind what makes this person sick and how can I do that? And I think as you look at your work associations, everything too, I mean, you involuntarily do that every day. If you're working with people, you, you, you make those decisions that, that perhaps you don't totally agree with somebody, but you're going to go along with it because they have the right to have their ideas and what they're doing to So I do think it's a very um, difficult kind of situation in, in doing that. But I do think it's still worth seeking leadership in a world that needs leadership. Yes, really? <laughs> I have that bumper sticker in my office, okay? <laughs> And it's, it's difficult, it's, it's very difficult, I think, for young girls because they all, they want to belong. They want to belong to a group, they want to belong to a group of friends. And so, if they're in a group of friends who maybe be involved in some leadership positions are not something that they care about, that, that she cares about, it's hard for them. I went through that and I, well, I kind of, one of the people that, um, Scholastically wanted to do well, and my group of friends was a much more a social group of friends, and so it just got to the point that I had to have two groups of friends. One that care, cared about how that well they were doing in school, and the other one that you know that cared about having fun, because you kind of have to make those choices. But I think the best way to encourage girls in that age is to try to help them find something that they can do 
or is it something they can volunteer for a school, you know, a church, or some other organization out there, and get out and, and try it. And see, because if you've got, if you've got the urge, it's going to bubble up someplace, and you are basically saying, okay, it's time for me to, to do that. Now, if you're just doing these kind of leadership things to build a resume, shame on you. Because, and that's what a lot of people do. They'll join all these organizations and maybe they'll get elected as positions to it and basically say, well, this will look good in my resume. Now, I understand in college there's a lot of pressure to build a resume. So when you, when you I have a granddaughter out at Ohio State that's in the midst of doing that right now. But if you're not fairly, you're not being fair to yourself, and you're not being fair to the group that you've volunteered for under that sort of circumstances. As many times you come in, you do a little bit, you can then add it to your resume, and you move on and do something else. But employers are pretty, um, they're pretty observant uh, in the situation, and so our resume needs to be solid. It needs to be based on things that you've agreed to do, leadership positions that you have taken, or it doesn't have to be the B leadership position. It has to be just something that you're doing in that situation. And I think you just have to, to take these young girls and um, encourage them. It's still, it's sometimes they care more about one thing than the other, and you have to help them to move over here and say, this is going to help you a, a great deal over here. It's nice to have good friends that you, you know, can, can have activities with, but if you've got to urge, You've got the ability, and everybody has the ability to be a leader. Many people don't want to be. Uh, many people are shy. It's hard for them. I've had, until you've watched that, an institute, and we, we do public speaking. And so I, you, you see some of the women that get up to do their first public speech, and actually, the rostrum will be shaking because they're shaking. And it's, it's, but they have to, you have to kind of get over that in that situation because public speaking and being able to do it well has a big advantage for you in, in whatever you're doing out there. So you keep working with them and tell them, you know, there's, there's a long road ahead, get started now if you really want to have, have the access. Yeah. Everything. Advantage of it, right? Sure. I, I, you know, I, I never really, as I've gone through, you know, my life, I never really thought of campfire in, in that type of a situation, but you were right, because when I was there, I went to camp in the summer, I was a camp counselor. I was a camp counselor to teach canoeing. I knew nothing about canoeing, all right? But I did know a little bit about finances, so I was also the person that sold all of the materials when they were doing their projects and kept track of the money. So, But it was, I learned again about with a group of, you know, we probably girls were maybe in the fifth grade, fifth grade, seventh grade. You, you learn something. Yeah, you have to start in elementary school and do that. And then I had a high school group in Camp Hill Girls at the Colorado Rising Club. And so I made the, um, I, I'm telling you some, some of my funny stories that probably don't have any time to do the leadership, but they do. So we made a, I made a leadership decision because there was a, a badge they were trying to earn that talked about state government. So none of you in this room remember this, but there used to be a train of Anderson Columbus. Um, or Finley and actually um, Columbus. So I decided I would bring my group to Columbus for a day. I have no idea if I got parents let them go with me. I, no, I, wasn't, very, I wasn't very much older than they were. All right, so we boarded the train early in the morning and came down here. Not only did I do that, 
I made the stupid decision to tour the old Ohio Penitentiary. Now that was, I look back at that and I'm thinking, where was my mind? <laughs> if these parents knew I was taking them to the penitentiary. But you know, it's not there anymore. I bet you that still sticks in their mind that they actually went to the old Ohio Penitentiary. So it's kind of a fun thing to do, um, but sometimes judgment. But they don't forget that kind of thing if they have that opportunity. So thank you for, thank you for being a leader. When I came down here, Camp Fire Girls is not big, so I ended up being the good scout leader. So similar, similar kind of thing. Yes, yes. Questions. Um, in Ohio, George Winovich, George Winovich was governor, mayor of Cleveland, uh, United States senator, a very unusual guy from Cleveland. Um, he probably taught me as much and mentored me as much. And he was younger than I, you know, a few years younger than I am. But he was, he was a great mentor in Billy Matt because he was doing the leadership that he had for the proper reason. If you remember, he resigned, as some of you will remember, he resigned as lieutenant governor and went back to Cleveland when Cleveland was in financial problems, uh, took over as mayor, got them out of debt, put Cleveland back on its feet. How many people would have resigned the lieutenant governor position to go back and save his home community? But he was a wonderful person, a wonderful mentor. Now, he was a leader. It was definitely doing leadership for the right reason in, in that particular situation. I spent some four years in Washington, D.C. Not four years that I necessarily want to repeat. I was the um, co-chairman of the Republican National Committee. I apologize if that offends anybody here, but it was a fact. Uh, because I had been very much involved in the George W. Bush campaign for president for a time. And he asked if I would come and be co chairman of the party. Um, didn't want to go, didn't, didn't want to live in Washington, negotiated it so I could come home. It was Friday. Uh, so I managed four years of doing that. But I had a great admiration for him, too. I know many people don't think that he accomplished much as president, but things are beginning to change in the years since he's been gone. But he was a genuine human being that obviously was interested in people and, and would take time to mentor young people. Um, and so he made quite an impression on me too. I wish I could say that in that group, that there I can name a woman who I was close to, obviously, but there weren't very many women back when I first started who were Dorothy Peters, who was a member of Columbus City Council. Uh, Dorothy and I did a lot of things together. But I can't say that there's that one woman that I focus on because I've probably been mentored more by many of, of, of the men just because there's more of them situation or that they would put up with me or whatever because um, but I, I was privileged to be able to serve George was speaking in the house for a couple of years in his governorship. So. I've been very fortunate in meeting a lot more people than you know, that it's just some, some by accident, some by design. Um, I can't put a person. I got to meet Maggie Thatcher, and she was over here one time, which is a person that I really wanted to meet in that situation. Uh, I have been um, close to your West of Death um, resident, John Kasich. John Kasich and I started out our political careers about the same time. And so he was, he got elected, he was my senator, you know, then he was my congressman. So I've been through that and I thought it was very um, appropriate that he was here last week actually making his final state of the state speech to the people that he really respected and loved, and who gave him his start. 
And so I have enjoyed that friendship for the years. And he's certainly somebody who, whether you agree with him or whether you don't agree with him, doesn't make, he, he is a leader. He's going to take a leadership position. He's going to speak out with a, you know, sometimes you might want to say, maybe you don't want to get, get way out on the limb there. But it's because he believes strongly in it. So he is who he is, and, and I think he's done a, a good job. So thanks for that. I think it's hard when you think that. You know, there's, many people have one particular mentor that kind of guided them through their entire career. I've kind of bounced around. I, I feel like my career's been a roller coaster. Not much plan. Take advantage of the opportunities that are there when you can. And, and hopefully another door will open for you to do something next. Question, Debbie. Anatomy of a campaign? I'm going to take on how to get involved first because that's the easiest, quite frankly. Um, you just show up. I mean, everybody will say, I want to be involved in the campaign, what do I do? And I said, well, you just follow the activities there, maybe pick your candidates, you know, pick up where they may be going door to door or whether they're having a, some kind of a rally or something, and you just show up. And after, as a volunteer, and then if you volunteer, well, you know, is there anything I can do to help? After you show up about three times to volunteer, they'll ask you to be sure of it because volun I'm serious because volunteers are hard to get and good volunteers that show up willingly, you know, are, are they're worth any amount of campaign contribution, believe me. I'd take a good volunteer any day versus a significant campaign contribution. An outline of a campaign is everybody kind of gets in a campaign and they think that everybody knows them. Well, you don't know you. I mean, it's the people you go to church with and your family and the people that you socialize with know you. But unless you got to handle here, where everybody knows her because we're physician. But most people that are starting out can have that. So really, you try to, I'm a big believer in getting and surrounding yourself with a group of, of um, friends who you trust and who's interested in your future. And hopefully some of them who have a little political experience and you put together a kitchen cabinet and you meet with this group of people once a week, any place in your home, you know, whatever. I used to meet with mine in a coffee shop in downtown uh, Westerville, which no longer here. And you talk about what you need to do, but you have to have a plan for something. It doesn't have to be a major detailed plan, but it has to be a plan. People don't know me, how do I get them to know me? How do I let them know what I'm about? Which means it's hard work. It's knocking on doors. Uh, it is uh, obviously trying to raise enough money that you can send some mail pieces that introduce you. It's filling up the candidates' nights and uh, speaking. It is obviously touching base with some of the key leaders of the community so they know who you are, you know, and, and they know you're interested in doing that. And it's just it's working all of the time and hopefully getting a small group of people that will work with you. Because it, 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 depending upon where you're running, city council obviously easier for smaller group of people. Many of them just familiar with your community. And I, I go back to the first election that I ran and lost. And what I realized after that election, Debbie, is I didn't give them support group. You know, you can't do it by yourself. You need some other group that at least has some interest in you getting elected. And I just wanted to I wanted to work. And so the next time I ran, you know, I had maybe 20, 25 women who were willing to do many of these things. I used to have little three by five cards that I would make up for every voter in Reynoldsburg. And then the night, you know, the night before the election, I would distribute them out there to the 20 people and make a call everybody the night before. It's, it doesn't take money to do everything. Money is definitely a part of it. Probably too much of a part of it, quite frankly. If you're looking at what's happening in Ohio right now, you're going to have a multi-million dollar governor raise, a multi-million dollar senate raise, so it's going to be a, a tough year here. But, it, but it's that involvement, because I'm a great believer that 
Once you've made a contact with the voter, if, if you've knocked on their door, there's a residual value of that that lasts. One year I was crazy enough for the Kansas Sheriff to decide that we would destroy the buses. I would not advise any of you to do that, especially at 6 o'clock in the morning. So we would go up, you know, some area in, in Fresno County, usually start up in Worthington because of high street buses. And we would arrive to get a bus, and then we'd have a driver follow us. We'd ride maybe three blocks or four blocks, then we'd jump off and go back and ride the next bus. Well, people at 6 in the morning are not interested in you handing them pieces of literature. Now, if you had a cup of hot coffee, that would be good. So we started a little later after that. But I still have people today who say to me, I remember meeting you on the bus. It's, it has a lasting value out there. I wouldn't do that again for any, any reason I wouldn't. But back then, it, it, you know, it really did help. And there is that research of that. But once you touch base with the voter, they're going to remember you. They do not remember you the way you want them to remember you, but they're going to remember you one way or the other. Enjoy that. And I think that scares people off, Debbie, when you talk about trying to put a campaign. But it's just like, it's just like you do something in force to them. I mean, something that you've brought a group together, people together that are dedicated in getting this done. You could just, I, I, every year at Easter, I think about this. It's a meeting to be some playground equipment on one of the elementary schools in Reynoldsburg. And I told them to involve the PTA, so I decided we have to have enough to raise money. So I decided that we would sell chocolate Easter bunnies. But they shipped them all to my garage, and the weather got warm. And so I'm sitting there looking at the garage full of Easter bunnies and saying, well, what am I going to do if they all melt? Fortunately, they didn't melt, and we were able to live the next month. But those are the kind of things that you do, and you look back on it and say, I'm not getting crazy. Probably. Most people will probably tell you that I am. <laughs> yes, Jim. A candidate. Absolutely. Because they're, they're both for, you know, quickly moving to be the controlling vote and for the need for involvement, they are going to agree with you more on doing that. And quite frankly, it can be fun. It's kind of like, you know, you get bitten by politics, like the dog that chases the fire engine. I'm curious, when you get into it and you have a good experience with it in the campaign, it's something that's fun and that you want to do and it's exciting in many situations. And frankly, if you're putting up a lot of a television ad. I don't want the young people to be looking at them before they put up and say, oh, this is not, this is crazy. Nobody's going to believe that because they've got a, a different opinion than many of the people that are sitting there looking at that. And you have to be sure that what you're putting up and spending good money for is going to be the majority of the vote it was in that situation. So, okay. It's threatening to the job market, let's just be honest about it. If, you know, the situation is you need to have more women that are, you know, that are employed in the company, more women that serve on your board, more women here, more women there, 
and I don't think for the young man, I don't think it probably just looks like that threatening, but for the other men that have a few years on them, it's kind of the situation is, well, what does that mean for me? Is it going to be harder for me to get a job situation? And then, you know, when there's some of the issues that happen uh, in the workplace that involve women, then, then you may scare some employers off of not hiring women for that situation, too. I think the Me Too movement has obviously stirred up women and basically saying it's time that we stood up and did more. Like frankly, it's time we had more women run for office. But I think if you take it too far, at some particular point in time, it becomes to be counterproductive uh, at that particular stage. Thank you for being a good audience. I wish I was an expert in teaching you about leadership. I can only share what it meant to me. Thanks so much.